Alrighty, welcome back to the History of Rock and Roll. In this unit, we're going to be covering and exploring the huge market of the teens of the 1950s that we started on in our last unit. This helped establish and sustain rock and roll music even past the time of the day the music died. Be sure you're reading or have already begun reading pages 112 through 119 in your textbook, which also explores in more depth this same topic. An interesting point is that the term teenager was specifically coined and promoted around 51, right around the time rhythm and blues, which was soon to be morphing into what we know as rock and roll, was beginning and the craze was starting. In fact, uh, in an article by The Independent by writer Mark Simpson in 2007, he states the teenager was perhaps the first subject to be created almost entirely by marketing. Little wonder that in a post-war world built on ruins of fascism and the American dream of marketing and consumption. And from closer to the time period, uh, from an article by Joe Stafford in Billboard of uh, October of 1958, it's, he says, rock and roll is an economic thing. Uh, today's 9 to 14 year old group is the first generation with with enough money given to them by their parents to buy records in sufficient quantities to influence the market. In my youth, the author's youth, if I asked my father for 45 cents to buy a record, he'd have thought seriously about having me committed. Kind of interesting, puts it into perspective, doesn't it? Around the same time, a uh, Philadelphia native, Mr. Dick Clark, uh, was now trying to market using his own style, very in, uh, shrewd businessman as well, to reach this really potential market of teens. And he used the latest new media of the time, the television, starting a program of teenagers dancing to the hits of the latest and greatest stars. His goal was primarily to not only tap into the prosperous teen market, but to make rock and roll and popular music more comfortable for parents and other adults. One way he did this was through his rather strict dress code and strict dance code. Once Bandstand became national, it changed its name to American Bandstand and remained a staple for teens throughout the generations from the 1950s all the way to its uh, final show in 1989. I remember very clearly getting up as a kid in the 70s and every Saturday around noon watching American Bandstand and watching our peers, our teens, our ages do the latest dances. The show also highlighted artists, uh, bands, individual artists of the time, but they would lip sync not play their actual instruments um, or sing live. We didn't seem to mind. It, it was perfectly fine for us. In the unit of our course, there are a couple of video links you can click on to see some clips from American Bandstand from the 1970s. You'll quickly be able to tell that the strict dress code and dance code have no longer been in place for some time by the 1970s, fallen by the wayside, but it is a interesting capture of that time period. In our last unit, we learned a little bit about Rock's super promoter, disc jockey Alan Freed, and his ultimate demise in the business due to participating in payola. Payola literally means pay for play. Almost all disc jockeys and many marketers of music participated in payola at one time or another in their careers. Ultimately, Mr. Freed was, uh, uh, Unfortunately, pardon me, uh, Mr. Freed was unapologetic about admitting that he had received a Cadillac and monetary gifts to play other people's records. Most likely, um, Dick Clark also in was involved in payola, but very smart and smart enough not to get caught. Mr. Freed did make an interesting point comparing payola to governmental lobbying. Um, we seem to accept that our lobbyists uh, pay for votes to a certain extent, uh, but it's a different world when it comes to, apparently, music. 
Don Kirshner is an interesting marketer and a creative individual as well. He decided to, to create distance between himself and a segment of the music from the whole payola scandals and chose rather to redirect rock and roll back to its creative elements. He established his Alden music, which was similar to the Tin Pan Alley um, uh, era in the early 20th century that we talked about earlier in the first unit, and that it was a series of offices where songwriters would churn out hits. They were located in what was called the Brill Building, which was a series of offices centered around the music industry. Uh, at Alden Music was a very young Carol King and Neil Sedaka, and very talented songwriters for this company. Kirshner helped foster a new group of girl singing groups modeled after the doo-wop male singers of the 1950s. These early girl groups often sang about love, lost and gained, and the emotions of women or girls in love. Please take a moment now uh, to listen to the song Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow by the Shirelles that's on your CD that came with your textbook. You'll notice that the singer in the song clearly is in love, but she is dually concerned about her reputation. This stigma in Catch-22 has and continues to be a challenge for women. Literally, if I act out on my feelings for him, will he still love me tomorrow, and will I still be considered a good girl? Our discussion of Phil Spector first came up last unit when we learned about what was reverberation in, in, in music. His producing technique was heavy on the reverb, so much so that the music he produced had the name The Wall of Sound, since that is a feeling one gets while hearing music he has produced. Right now, try to re-listen to Spanish Harlem, sung by Ben E. King, from our first week of class. King has so much reverberation in his voice, he sounds as if he's actually singing in the shower. Another girl group who sang Alden music songs, but were produced by Phil Spector, was the Ronettes. Their hit, Be My Baby, is an excellent example of the Spectre wall of sound style. Topically, the lyrics address a girl wanting her boy to stay and still love her. It's rather traditional and a safe subject matter for a girl group. Remember, girls could not yet take the risks or chances as pop artists that their male colleagues could. Please listen to Be My Baby by the Ronettes on your CD set now. Note the big, heavy produced sound and noticeable reverberation. Not every girl group lacked controversy, though. The Shangri-La's song, Leader of the Pack, tells a very gritty tale of a girl who falls in love with a rough hoodlum type of boy who even rides a motorcycle. There are even sounds of the motorcycle in the song. All of these things were taboo for good girls in the late 1950s and early 1960s. This song was too much for the conservative BBC, and it was banned in the United Kingdom. Even the look of the Shangri-Las was quite edgy for the time period. They wore pants and go-go style boots and more avant-garde hairstyles. This might seem silly in our current 21st century culture, but it was quite radical for 1964. Well, that's it for this unit. Be sure you've read or will be reading pages 112 through 119 in our text. And I'll see you in the next unit when we explore the California myth in the early 1960s and the music.